Victorian periodical parade. Hey, well, Owen, how are, you, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I am so tired. It was my teaching day. And I didn't even teach as much as I normally do because my first class, they had a test. I'm just so tired. Yeah. But I am teaching my favorite class right now called the history of the novel. Yeah. And I love I love teaching. Maybe this just shows what a nerd I am, but the idea that there used to not be novels, that that got invented one day, something that's Whoa. so normal to us, it just I find it a delicious thought to chew on and it oh. never gets old to me. When was that? In English in the 1720s. 1720s. Okay, yeah. So as with I, so many things, every other place in the world was superior. And like uh, Don Quixote in Spanish. Right. That's like 1600s. And France was was writing novels before England. But in England, the 1720s. Now, of course, you know, professors and scholars that are specialists in the development of the novel, they fight about which one was really the first one. But 1720s is the general. <laughs> time. Oh, okay, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any knowledge about uh, the Chinese uh, no. novel industry? I wonder. Gosh, no. Now I wonder. Yeah, because they, you know, they were writing poems and everything. And uh, we don't really have much papyrus from ancient Egypt, but I wonder if they were writing stories. Let me see if I can pull up anything. Oh. The Chinese novel is generally considered to have first appeared in the mid to late 14th century. Mm, there you go. 14th century. Um, okay. Yeah, in general, like, uh, there's no, there's definitely no sense in which the English novel was, you know, earlier than other languages. So it wasn't the total invention of the novel, but for the British people that I study, it was. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Unless they could have read French, which would have been, you know, probably a select few yeah, of the, the literate people. Yeah. But so, I took it for granted, right? Novels. They've always know, been around. I, just, I, I mean, I don't think that you're the best comparison. I always am like, is it just that I'm so nerdy that I get so excited about this idea? But <laughs> Of course you are too. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Like I want, like I just like I cannot communicate to my students enough how wild it is to me that like think about it. There was a time yeah. where there weren't novels, and I'm sure they're always sitting there being like, "Doctor Nixon, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. we got it. We got it. The first of the hundred times you said that this occurred, we're yeah, not but, that excited about it." <laughs> yeah, it's like, but give me the excitement back. I'm throwing it to you. You uh, give it back to me. Um, I just think it must have been like when smartphones were invented or cell phones or Facebook, yeah. like any other like total yeah. platform development, yeah. the way it must have shifted all of society. I just find it like I get goosebumps and I've taught this class like three times before. I still get goosebumps. Good, good. That's a good sign. Okay, and welcome to Victorian Periodical Parade, the podcast that introduces you to Victorian literature and Victorians who read it, not, however, in corpse or ghost form. And we'll be talking a little bit more about ghost stories today. Um, we're a little bit, we're in the wrong season, but I think it might surprise some of our listeners to find out what season is wrong, why it's wrong. <laughs> what are we reading, Owen? So we're going to be reading The Terrible Christmas Eve by Lucy Hardy. Now, Lucy Hardy, we can find tons of evidence of. You can look her up. She wrote tons of stories. Um, the rest of what I can find about her, I know only through this author and this book that you have uncovered. So why don't yes. you tell us a bit about that since we're breaking into, we're kind of covering her stories this season. Yeah, I think so. So I was just traveling around on Twitter and watching all the Victorian um, people and article and posts fly around. And I saw the editor of this book. Uh, Johnny Maines posting about his books and and he was liking our stuff and we just got into a rapport and he posted about having a Victorian era book and he found what he calls um, the lost stories of Catherine Lord and she was published under the pseudonym Lucy Hardy and at one point he found a little note that had both Catherine Lord on it and 
uh, L. Hardy. I think it was maybe an AKA L. Hardy. And so that was like the only way that those two names were ever connected. Because of course, even though there's evidence of Lucy Hardy, I don't think there was obvious evidence of where she lived or where she like came from. It was just, she's an author and she wrote a bunch of good books. And then that's where he connected the, the name Lucy Hardy to Catherine Lord, who lived from 1845 to 1901. And so then he just compiled most of her short stories is what it is. The kind of interesting thing here is that um, I don't know anything about Lucy Hardy. I'm not sure that there are, you know, too many people who would. So it's going to be kind of an interesting experiment in terms of giving context for these stories because I can't use anything that I know about the author's life. Um, And I think it's going to be kind of fun, actually. Whenever I try to teach my students to think of themselves like archaeologists and to Mm. think about everything in newspapers as an evidence creating the life of who these Victorians would have been and what they would have been thinking about. So it's going to be kind of a challenge for me to have to do that with no other clues other than everything else I know about the Victorian era. So it's going to be kind of fun. Yeah, that should be good. And then if we somehow stumble on a gold mine, somebody else knows more about Catherine Lord, then yeah. it'd be perfect. And we'd be like, oh, look at this. All of this lines up and now we know more. There is the introduction, which is the well-known writer, Lucy Hardy. And that talks about a lot of stuff about her life. Okay, here it is. So in a note, she wrote to the Globe, In a letter dated 1901 and published in the Globe four days after Queen Victoria's death, uh, definitively married Lucy's name to Miss Lords and even supplied her home address. It's actually a long note with a poem in it, and it ends, Yours truly, Miss C. Lord, Lucy Hardy, 54 Springfield Road, Abbey Road, Northwest. So... Mm. That's a pretty good, the needle in the haystack that he was searching for. So that's, that's a like a uh, famous, famously sought after scholar moments. Um, yes. Yeah. So in this episode, just to give you a quick overview of what we'll be doing, we'll read one of these stories that we picked. Well, Owen will read it. Then I will give you a breakdown of just some context for understanding it better, what it would have meant to the people reading it. Yeah, that's basically the main, of course, then we'll do our nonfiction section. This story that we picked, That Terrible Christmas Eve, Yep. That Terrible Christmas Eve, I couldn't find the magazine it was published in, The Courier. Um, As we've mentioned, if you listen to some of our earlier episodes, the Victorians were the people that just made the magazine and newspaper industry blossom. There were so, so, so many newspapers. Um. I have a a friend and colleague that I know that has studied and found Welsh newspapers written in Wales, like handwritten just for like the 15 people in their neighborhood. I mean, there are so many newspapers and magazines from these times. And so, you know, in spite of as many academic databases as I may be a member of where they just (laughs) host old British newspapers, Unless it's a pretty big one, your chances of being able to just quickly learn about, you know, The Courier is this magazine. They're pretty slim. Uh, And as I've said, you know, I am not a specialist in periodicals. Even if I were, there's too many for everyone to know. So I wasn't able to find anything really about The Courier, but I did find this story published in an Australian newspaper. So it's called... The Adelaide Observer. Mm. Um, And I think it was almost concurrently published, Owen. Um, Oh, that's awesome. What date did did this come out in The Courier? Uh, December 28th, 1892. Okay, this is December 17th, 1892. Oh. I don't know. Like, these are the things that, you know, somebody who is really able to research this a lot and probably somebody who knows more about periodicals than I do. Um, There were certain things about certain countries. Like I believe, oh God, I I feel like I shouldn't even talk about this without being, without knowing more, but certain countries were just really notorious for not having copyright laws. And so they would just swipe things from the second they saw it 
Um, I was just finishing a Wilkie Collins novel. Wilkie Collins was a famous, basically thriller novelist. He was best friends with Dickens, Charles Dickens. Oh, wow. Cool. I just finished a book of his last night. And like a huge part of the end of it was just he breaks the fourth wall and talks trash about the American publishing industry (laughs) and how they just steal everybody's stuff and don't care. And so I don't know, perhaps, you know, this was perhaps the courier was not the first to publish it. Yeah. I highly doubt this Australian newspaper was. So I wonder what the Australian laws would have allowed them to do. But yeah, so it's published right around the same time. And I will read a nonfiction article. Usually I choose them kind of at random just because there's some really fun stuff in there. Sometimes I try to find things that are parallels to the fiction because sometimes they would sort of anticipate readers wondering or thinking or wanting to know more about a topic in the story. Today I have some pretty good uh, randomly chosen ones which I will read and then I'll go into the significance of it and what they're talking about. I'll basically almost kind of translate it more than anything because some of their language and the context can be a little bit over your head if you're not familiar with it. (laughs) Okay well I found this story very fascinating. One thing I found really interesting about this is that it was super short. And the Victorians, the British Victorians were not really masters of the short story. That was actually much more an American art form, (laughs) which is kind of interesting to think about because in so many things, like, like with everything, insert my traditional caveat that I'm sure there's scholars out there that would roundly disagree with me. But in my <laughs> humble opinion, there is so much similar in 19th century America and 19th century Britain. Obviously, oh. just like Americans and British people have different sort of temperaments and stuff today that existed back then. But, you know, there was so much cross communication, especially after the development of the telegraph in the 1840s. There was so much communication that, as we were saying earlier, stories and author like novels would go back and forth so quickly. So they're reading the same things. Fashion is similar in both places. See, there's a lot of, I don't know if I would say they're similar cultures as much as I would say there's a shared cultural discourse and shared knowledge of the same things. So for all those similarities, it's very interesting that the British just weren't invested in the short story the way Americans were. And I actually grapple with this a lot as a professor because I never have anything. I'm a British scholar. So like I have nothing ever short to give my poor students to ease them into it. And generally, if I want to give them an example of like a short story about women's rights, I'll just assign an American one just to get them used to some of the ideas. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. There were (laughs) so-called short stories in that these British quote unquote short stories were not 900 page novels, but they still end up being 60 page stories. Oh, so you know, I think like Wilkie Collins would have been like, yeah, it's shorter than that novel I wrote. But like, (laughs) they're not short stories in the way we're accustomed to reading them by people like Shirley Jackson. And so that really struck me that she was writing this very short story. I was able to read it in 15 minutes, maybe, maybe. So that's one thing that just stood out to me. I don't have a lot to say about it, except that Perhaps that is a unique feature of her as an author that I think we'll kind of be able to test that theory and see how well it holds as we read more of her stories. The second thing, I'm I'm holding off getting to my favorite thing <laughs> because I think we should go over the general things about her first. With a name like Lucy Hardy, as you already know, Owen, because at School Fjorden, I always am bringing up Thomas Hardy, even though he's not Norwegian. <laughs> almost defiantly constantly bringing up Thomas Hardy. (laughs) And there would have been no way by 1892, for instance, I'm assuming she wrote a great deal of her work in the 80s and 90s. She was very aware of that drawing on the cultural clout of Thomas Hardy. Mm -hmm. He was so, so famous by that point. He was knighted by the end of his life. George Bernard Shaw was one of his pallbearers. I mean, the guy was, he was honestly, he he was born around the same time as Lucy Hardy in 1840. 
but he lived until almost 1930. Wow. And so what happened is Thomas Hardy came to represent for people like Virginia Woolf, yeah. Yates, the Irish poet. He came, he was the last living Victorian celebrity, essentially. Wow. They would all go visit him. They would send him their work. I mean, he was just kind of, even if they hadn't maybe really liked him in his heyday, it was like he represented like British excellence for them at that point. It was like a nationalistic type of pride. Yeah. So there is no way by the late 80s and 90s when uh, Hardy wasn't necessarily like the last living Victorian anymore, but he was in his peak of celebrity. That would have been an obvious thing. She's kind of name dropping and she's kind of making everybody wonder if she's related to him. Oh, yeah. Um, it would be like writing a book right now and be like, Owen's Owen Dickens like it's just a name everybody knows or Owen right. Shakespeare and so I think that's actually really clever and interesting the, the I would have just discarded that as an unimportant piece of trivia except for the undeniability of how much it would have brought to mind Thomas Hardy except for two things one she has characters named Hardy in this story so as the story is narrated in the first person, I actually noticed it because of one of your notes oh, that cool. you had labeled that it was Hardy. And I was like, no, Owen, right. just because it's in the first person, that doesn't mean it's her, the author talking. But then I saw like, actually, no, she is writing in the first person and it's not just some first person narrator. She is making it of the supposed Hardy lineage. Right. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah, no, I wouldn't have noticed it either. Um, so again, I guess I would add to that a sub point that that's kind of unique. I I don't know that I've really seen a novelist in this time or an author in this time who uses the first person and then specifically means that to apply to their novelist name. Hmm. So that's interesting. And so with her doing that and making it appear somehow that it gives perhaps a sense of verisimilitude that somehow she is really connected to, I mean, of course, people wouldn't have thought it was a pseudonym, but yeah. by giving this lineage, she's adding this sense of like real human history to her lineage, which would even more be bringing up Hardy. And right. Thomas Hardy was famous for writing about this one little part of England called Dorset. Okay. Yeah. Which is in the Southwest. It's about two... 90 minutes southwest of London, kind of goes down near the coast. Okay. And she sets her, and I, I noticed this because I almost thought she said that her family in the story is from Dorsetshire. And I was like, oh my God, she's really, really trying <laughs> to like build off his legacy. But no, she says Devonshire, yeah. which is just a little bit farther east. Um, so and smart. Oh, it's very interesting, but it's like right there, but not there. Yeah. And so Hardy famously was writing about Dorset, where he was from, to, I always say, to kind of show the, the literary elite in London that there was a value to understanding these very backwards rural cultures. I go to Dorset every couple of years, um, and it's still mostly composed of one lane roads. And by one lane, I mean, if somebody's coming the other direction, you have to back up into the hedges. Yeah. Literally one lane. Yep. So to think, you know, if it's um, to, to this day, most of the houses there have thatched roofs. That I is mean, epic. It is just, I don't want to call it a backwater because I love it, but like mm. it is so, so, so disconnected from everything we think of as modern society in 2021. So you can imagine when Hardy was writing in 1880, yeah. the Londoners reading Dickens and Wilkie Collins would have really turned their nose up and like, why do we care about this? Like they would have called it a backwater. Like why would we right. care about Dorset? Yeah. And so where Lucy Hardy is writing about is considered like even to Hardy, he would sort of exoticize this area. It's almost oh. out towards Cornwall. And Cornwall oh. has its own like interesting dialect and like they're considered very almost as different as like Welsh or something. Right. 
so she's doing some really interesting things by drawing on his legacy and literally imaginatively drawing the reader's mind's eye just a little bit farther more exotic and interesting and fascinating and maybe even a little spooky for this story. Right. The last thing I think we should definitely go over, I have five more minutes, <laughs> um, is that in this time period, ghost stories were a Christmas tradition. I opened the episode by saying, you know, listeners may feel this is a bit out of season because, you know, they're probably thinking it's not Halloween. But right. for the Victorians, ghost story time was Christmas time. And that oh. is why this is specifically happening on Christmas Eve. This is why regardless of what paper we find it in it's being published in december oh gotcha mm -hmm. dun, dun, dun. and i actually didn't really know the roots of this tradition i just know that it's a thing sure in the victorian era it comes out of like the winter solstice traditions of just like yeah. thinking that the veil between the worlds is thinner and right yeah yeah so the last thing I really want to say about this particular story is I meant I brought up ghost stories and there's got to be a few people out there that are like, but it's not a ghost story. It's a crime right. story. That's what I was hinting at, too, in my brain. Yeah. So this is what I find very interesting. She's clearly building on the Christmas ghost story tradition. There's no way yeah. around that with the title and the publication date. This is the content people would have been wanting. Mm. And all through the story, any well-read Victorian would have been waiting for the ghost. And in yes. fact, I was waiting for a ghost all story. I was like, <laughs> there's not a real guy in that bag or she's going to open the cupboard and there's not going to be anyone in there. Mm -hmm. And then, no, like, they were criminals and they were sent to prison and executed and the end, like, they murdered a lady down the road, like, good job, thank, thank God they didn't murder me. I actually specialized most primarily in the 1890s. We have very niche niches in academia. Yep. And this time period is called the fin de siècle. It means the end of the cycle. It's a very different cultural time than the mid-century. In the mid-century, we have... A lot of optimism. We've just, they've just come out of the Industrial Revolution. There's been some progressive social changes. People feel pretty good about the possibilities for the British nation. Hmm. By the late century, there's this sort of general disappointment and pessimism in society. This sense that, well, the Industrial Revolution brought us some problems too. Yeah. And colonialism isn't all we thought it would be. And maybe there's some real issues with that. And there's just a, a general sense in, in a broader way that sticking to what people might think of as the stereotypical Victorian norms of uprightness and family values didn't sort of reap the rewards society was still promised. There was still venereal disease oh, because yeah. people still cheated on each other. And in fact, <laughs> syphilis is a huge, huge concern late in the century, bringing up for people more than just the disease itself, but questions of like, what were these family values supposed to yeah. get me, you know? And yeah. why isn't anything working out the way we promised? Along with this, pragmatically, we've seen over the century rampant industrialization and urbanization. I personally think that this is why the detective novel comes about in the late century. Sherlock Holmes is an, uh, a figure of the very, uh, of the 1880s and 90s. And this is the way I always tell my students. In the 1840s, if a stranger comes into town, nobody's seen him before. And the next day, one of neighbor Joe's sheep is missing and you see the stranger riding away on the sheep, it's pretty clear to everyone. You can know what happened. You knew that nobody in your town of 15 people knew that guy. You know that there you are down one sheep of your 20 or whatever. And the guy can't get away that fast. You know, he's like walking a sheep away. Right. The way I put it two ways, you could not have crime stories in the way they did, like the detective novel type thing, until the 1890s. You could not have it. And it was also not really demanded until then. Yeah. So two things. What you have all of a sudden is a very crowded, anonymous world. Yes. 
let's say you're living in London and in London, you lose your pocket watch. You're never going to know where that pocket watch went because Mm -hmm. not only do you not know anyone around you probably, but there's thousands and thousands of people around you. It could be any one of them and whoever it was could get away on the next railroad and be on the other side of the country. So the the story of crime fiction now of course crime fiction way predates the victorian era but i mean this sort of crime novel where everything's tied up in a neat little bow and the problem is solved and the bad guys are punished oh. this sort of crime story in my worldview only comes about and is only desired by people at this late period because they're stressed out about yeah. these things. There's so much uncertainty. Even by the mid-century, you find people writing stories about body doubles and people yeah. pretending to be, because there weren't social security cards. Right. Because yeah. you didn't need them before, but all of a sudden we need them and we don't have a system. And how do we know who anybody is? Mm-hmm. It's like Victorian catfishing, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah, except you could like just become a person. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. And you see lots of fiction written in like the late 1860s about that. And by the 90s, it becomes the crime narrative, the kind of the procedural crime narrative where they're like, boom, 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 we fixed it. And so it not only was demanded to sort of help people process these anxieties and worries, but it also in general wasn't possible because you couldn't have the same sort of high speed getaways and chases and telegraphing ahead to the next city to say, catch (laughs) them. In Bleak House, we do see it. We see a horse and carriage police chase and it is so freaking boring. Like you need that urgency and that speed to make it kind of captivating. So What I found really interesting about this story is simply that she took this old, old tradition of the Victorian ghost story and updated it for the modern taste. And it was just a Victorian crime story. There was nothing otherworldly. In fact, it was, I don't know, I got kind of an icky feeling from reading it. Like it was just these home invaders like she had been in actual danger it wasn't you know this kind of titillating suspense of like the ghost that might be there it was like no that guy was probably gonna murder you and your grandma like it was really gritty yeah yeah it was and along those lines because i had read similar and more of the victorian ghost stories i was waiting for the grandma to hear walk down the stairs and die and and to become a ghost right there and mm-hmm. and like instantly haunt the house and maybe scare the guy out but yeah i was oh yeah the jacket says the collection of ghost stories well and i have to imagine that readers were expecting the ghost so it's kind of right. fun to be like we were feeling what they were feeling like yeah. we were in their spot to be like where's the-? like i was so convinced that guy in the sack was a ghost <laughs> oh really yeah you, yeah yeah you were even deeper in in the, <laughs> in the victorian reading and i was like somebody's gonna die right <laughs> yeah. or when she first spoke about the face in the window i was like there's the ghost it, oh gonna- yeah for sure yeah, i was like, like they think it's an intruder window. but it's a ghost it's like yeah. some yeah yeah, it's perfect. Completely. Coming up now, we have Kari Nixon reading the newsstand, where we talk about what the Victorians were reading. Besides fiction. And in this section, we're going to break down what that means for listeners today and what that meant for the Victorians who were reading about the news articles or the things pertaining to their daily life. So, as I said, I found this Australian newspaper that had printed this story and I just scanned around and found an interesting page. There's a section here called British and foreign Anglo colonial gossip. And I might read that because I'm increasingly invested in studying colonialism, but I see this other one that says 11 men froze to death in quotes. (laughs) In Australia? Well, it's nice and intriguing. Not. Well, of yeah. course not, but it's intriguing to be like, this is in an Australian art uh, newspaper. They had wandered round and round in that blinding snowstorm, hopelessly lost in a place only a hundred yards square. And when cold and fatigue vanquished them at last, they scooped out a cave in the snow and lay down and died. 
not knowing that five steps more would have brought them into the true path. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Thus, 11 precious lives were lost in making the descent from Mont Blanc in September 1870. They suffered the bitterest deaths recorded in the history of these mountains, full as that history is with dreadful tragedies. Okay, so this would have been, they're talking about something 20 years earlier, which is interesting. Yeah. Mont Blanc is a mountain that was made famous by the early century romantic poets. Uh, well, I mean, they might, it might have been famous before them, but they famously, right. so the romantic poets, I'm just teaching this in my British lit class. The romantic poets are from like the 1815 time period. Okay. Um, so way before the Victorian era. And they really wanted, they believed that if they could seek out amazing and awesome enough landscapes and wilderness that they could encounter sublime experiences mm. and then later like discover truths, psychological truths from these experiences. So yeah. one very famous poem um, written by Shelley is about all about Mont Blanc. Like, and so everybody would just go see Mont Blanc. Like this is a thing. I'm curious why this is important enough to write 20 years later. Let's see. Sad to think they were so near safety and yet through ignorance so far from it. Alas, how many die under different conditions, but for a like reason. Here's a man who says, all my friends thought I was doomed and I did not care whether I lived or died. He explains as follows. Up to October 1885, he says, I was a strong, healthy man and equal to any kind of work. At this time, I was taken with a pain that seemed to shoot straight through my heart. I felt as if something was squeezing my heart and I was in dreadful agony. I had to abandon work and lie up. Then I fell into a low, weak way. I had no appetite and every morsel I ate gave me a great pain at the chest and a tight, uncomfortable feeling as if all my food turned to wind and did not pass my stomach. I had a great pain at my back and sides and was never free from pain night or day. Such food as I was able to take lay like a load on my stomach and my heart would thump so badly I could get no sleep and night after night I would lie awake. That week I dare not lift the lightest article, and so nervous that the slightest sound startled me. Even the children's noise as at play upset me. When I ventured out of doors, I had to often stand and rest, and my legs were so unsteady I could not walk straight. All this told on my spirits. Before my attack, I scarcely knew my strength. I could lift a sack of flour with ease. I went to our doctor, who said mine was a bad case. He gave me medicines, but I got no relief from them. Now better, now worse, but never well. I remained in this state for over 12 months and was under the doctor all that time. At last, the doctor recommended me to go to Norwich Hospital and put myself under a celebrated physician there as an indoor patient. I did so in November 1886. The physician said, your heart is strained and very weak. Whilst in the hospital, I was examined by three doctors, and after being under treatment five weeks, my case was pronounced incurable. The doctor said I would never be able to do hard work again and would never get any stronger. I was now anxious to get home. So I left the hospital but kept on receiving medicine as an outdoor patient for three months longer. Getting weaker and weaker, I gave up taking their medicine and tried different medicines my friends told me of, but nothing did any good and I lingered on month after month. Now indeed I began to despair, for from a strong, powerful man I was reduced almost to a shadow and did not care whether I lived or died. In June 1887, a book was left at my house which described a preparation called Mother Siegel Syrup, and I read of one case like mine being cured by it. I said to my wife, here is a case that exactly corresponds with my case. I had lost all faith in medicines, but as a last resort sent to Mr. Edgeley Supply Store's Bungay for a bottle and had not taken more than half the contents before I felt better. Wife, I said, I believe this Siegel Syrup is going to cure me. I began to eat and food did me good and I grew stronger and stronger. After taking three bottles, I got back to my work strong and healthy. And since then, I have never looked behind me. By taking an occasional dose, I keep in good health. I can now eat anything and do any kind of work and went through harvesting as well as anyone and can lift a pig with ease. 
I thank God that Siegel syrup was ever made known to me and feel that I owe my life to it. You are at liberty to publish this statement as I am willing to tell any one of the benefit I have derived from the medicine. Yours truly, Mr. Robert Wright, Urum Bungay, Norfolk, signed by a witness, Isaac Wright. Mr. Wright's, it continues, Mr. Wright's complaint was indigestion and dyspepsia, and the heart disturbance which so alarmed him was the result of the mechanical pressure of the stomach against the heart when the latter was inflated with the gases created by undigested and fermenting food. Many are most led thus to mistake indigestion for some other malady. We can only say we are glad our friend found the true path, the right medicine, before his disease left him no remnant of life to blow into the flame. <laughs> so is that connected to the snow story? Yeah. <laughs> so it seems like the snow story, like they basically were like, they were so close to getting out, but they weren't like, they were so close right. to the answer, but they died. And I guess yeah. it's a stretchy, like a stretch. It's of a kind metaphor. of a stretch. And does it, does it sound like it's also an advertisement? Yeah. It yeah. Did, I, I got halfway through it and I was like, oh, this is a, a weird ad. Yeah. But then I was like, I saw like commentary on his statement and I was like, well, maybe it's not. I'm trying to see if it goes on to the next page just in case, but no. Yeah, yeah no, but, that's just an ad. Like clear. Yeah. I mean, maybe some guy actually wrote that, but then the company right. clearly published it. Yeah. Um, what I can say about that though, because this is another thing that kind of gave us uh, a trick, like a sleight yeah. of hand like the ghost yep. story so it's kind of cool thematically this sort of narrative of being like the victorian invalidity is so 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 common yeah and that's why it was able to even like fool me into right. being like oh this is just some guy's story of his illness and his journey through that because i mean it's so common i just did an annotated bibliography about scholarly analyses of Victorian contagion and a huge part of what I was finding was more just studies of this idea of the, the Victorian state of chronic illness what it meant for them how we would perceive it today and so this is just such a common genre that they've really cleverly I think yeah. I think it would have also roped other readers in because you're right. like oh you're talking about like kind of romantic poetry that's kind of yeah. highbrow and oh this is like one man's journey through illness like sometimes I've had weird problems that I struggle mm -hmm. with and then you get to the end and you're like, oh my Seagulls. God, it was an ad. Yeah. It's like, oh my gosh, it's such an obvious ad. But then it's such a good story. Like, I know a lot of good emotion and a lot of good details. But there is a weird disconnect between the Mount Blanc and this. Like, that was super weird. Yeah. It's a big transition, too big. It's kind of like, I don't know. I feel like I've seen like, ads on the internet that are just as tricky as that <laughs> yes. where you're like oh. you think you're watching a real thing and or a commercial somebody yeah no i've seen commercials YouTube that video. are yeah i've yeah. seen i can't think of one off the top of my head but i've seen ones that kind of trick you and you don't yeah. realize it's an ad and then at the end you just feel so bad because you're like oh i watched that so intently and now it's just an ad. yes yeah that's what that was yeah. i know i had all these thoughts to be about like these are like very human experiences and like i've been mm -hmm. struggling with these health things and i think mm -hmm. everybody's gone through this and now i don't want to because i just feel so right. tricked. i wonder how the victorians would feel at the end it kind of seems like they would be like, oh, if I ever have this problem, I'm going to go mm. look for seagulls. Do you think they would take it positively? No, I would be tempted to feel like they'd be tricked like us. Like, OK, All but right. maybe I'm just assuming they'd feel like me. No, Victorian advertising culture was so fascinating. Um, oh, cool. Sometimes I'll just look through the ads just to like see how they talk about it. It's very, yeah. very interesting and maybe something we can cover as the nonfiction section someday. So uh, that was pretty cool. I learned a lot. Did you hear about that, that like shipwreck off the San Juan Islands recently? No. Really? No, I, I, I think I missed that one. There were like, all these people died. And um, anyway, I've been having some really bad heartburn. And I have just been like really beside myself trying to figure out answers and figure out what's wrong with me. Anyway, take Prilosec. 
what i was trying to mimic <laughs> what he did yeah. no i yeah I, I, <laughs> but it was you did a very short version and i was like oh it's an advertisement <laughs> <laughs> Victorian Periodical Parade. Victorian Periodical Parade.